Every star we see in the sky has, on average, one planet around it. And what we want to know is what are those planets like, and are any of them like the Earth? To do that, what we're trying to understand is how do planets form and what are the processes that control what the, fine, what the planet ultimately looks like. And the main way that we define planetary habitability is by whether there's liquid water at the surface of the planet. And the reason for that is that all types of life on Earth that we know about use liquid water at some point in their life cycle. And if we go searching for life on different planets, we have to look for life that's at least somewhat like Earth, Earth life, because otherwise we'd have no idea if what we found was life or not. It could be so different we'd have no idea what it was. They say you can't step into a brook twice. Water is always moving, you see, like life. And that's fine for metaphors, or for the brook curious people who take it at face value. But what does that mean to us in a practical sense? Why, it means the world is moving rapidly around us, constantly changing. Do you remember the last time you had a hostess fruit pie? Or played with clay? The process of building a planet takes millions of years and involves small dust grains interacting with one another, colliding, and sticking, and growing larger throughout this, throughout this period of time. So an interesting example of a non-habitable planet as far as we know in our solar system, is Venus. And Venus is very similar to Earth in size and in composition. Time changes the world, and time changes us. This isn't even fun to me anymore. Eventually they give way to things as big as asteroids, and those asteroids come together to build things as big as the moon. And eventually those moon-sized objects come together to form the planets that we see today. Except it formed closer to the sun than Earth did. And because of that, it either got less water delivered to it, or the water was all lost to space. And it subsequently had an atmospheric evolution, so that now it has an atmosphere that's about 100 times as thick as Earth, and a surface that's extremely hot and can't have any water on it, and it's uninhabitable. So you have a very similar planet that's not habitable. They say one value of art is its immutable quality, the permanent relevance of truth. But sometimes time changes us for the better, makes us able to do more push-ups, or obtain higher quality analog stereo equipment. Time decays, but it burnishes and hones. So it's a very chaotic process where small differences in the initial conditions can yield very different results. Much like Singer's Grave, A Sea of Tongues by Bonnie Prince Billy. Songs from the record Wolfroy Goes to Town here on Singer's Grave, A Sea of Tongues burst forth like a sweet pea flower bed. Bright, colorful, and out in the sunlight. Now I don't know any advanced mathematics, but I feel compelled to mention the Jim Shepard touted physics of Feynman's two-slit experiment, where observation changes the behavior of the observed electrons. And to me, that sort of is a qualitative artistic way of thinking about the idea that in the universe, there's an infinite amount of possibilities of different types of life, depending on the atmosphere that it grows in. Small differences in the formation of this record can yield a very different musical experience. The universe operates in a way we have little intuitive knowledge of, and outside of math, requires a flawed set of terms to discuss it. Even so, though, it's a hell of a record. Pick it up on Drag City.